Centuries of Oppression, The Road to 1918, Chapter 15, The Hypocrisy of Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst. Early in her autobiography, My Own Story, Emmeline Pankhurst writes, The militancy of men through all the centuries has drenched the world with blood, and for these deeds of horror and destruction, men have been rewarded with monuments, with great songs and epics. The militancy of women has harmed no human life, save the lives of those who fought the battle of righteousness. Within months of writing this, at the outbreak of World War I, Mrs Pankhurst would be touring the country, addressing crowds of men, exhorting them to join the army and go to fight in the trenches. How like modern day feminists, who constantly remind us that war is all men's fault. Yet in the UK vote to go to war against Iraq in 2003, 83 women MPs voted in favour out of the 104 women who voted, a larger proportion of women MPs in favour of war than male MPs. Similarly, the 2015 vote on bombing Syria was carried partly thanks to more women MPs voting in favour, 98, than against, 83. And whilst Tory women were whipped to vote in favour, there were substantially more women MPs in the other parties who might have been expected to bring the female vote down against the bombing, especially having a party political motive to do so. But history shows that women in positions of power have no more reluctance to send men into battle than do male leaders. It must be very convenient to have someone else do your dirty work and doubly so if you can afterwards burden them with the moral culpability. But I digress. During the Great War, the suffragettes suspended their campaigning activities. Mrs Pankhurst expressed it thus, so ends for the present the war of women against men. Rather a revealing way of expressing it and a total colossal mistake. After suspending their suffrage campaigning, Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst took to speaking at recruiting drives for the war. The potential recruits would be largely from the working classes and hence would not have the vote. It surely is just to accuse the Pankhursts of hypocrisy. They were insistent on their own right to the vote whilst remaining safely at home, but at the same time they were happy to send to their deaths men whose right to vote they did not recognise as significant. This must surely rank as one of the most flagrant pieces of political hypocrisy of all time. But there was worse, the White Feather Campaign. The suffragettes would patrol the streets looking for any male in civilian dress who might be of fighting age and shame them by pinning a white feather to their chest. The suffragettes would turn up in force at public meetings such as at Hyde Park Corner carrying banners reading, intern them all. They were very keen to remind men of what, in their opinion, was a man's duty. They were not so keen on recognising that these same men might also deserve the constitutional rights they claimed only for themselves. It is perhaps difficult in our modern times to appreciate just how vehemently determined the women of Britain were to send men, all men, to fight in World War I. These are the words which Emmeline Pankhurst used to address recruiting rallies. The least that men can do is that every man of fighting age should prepare himself to redeem his word to women and to make ready to do his best to save the mothers, the wives and daughters of Great Britain from outrage too horrible even to think of. What she was thinking of, by the way, 
were the stories then circulating about the behaviour of the German troops as they tore through Belgium on their way to France. Whilst history has dubbed it the Rape of Belgium, that phrase refers mostly to the shooting of around 6,000 civilians rather than the outrage Pankhurst feared. The shootings were generally for acts of resistance, real or perceived, and so the victims would have been overwhelmingly men. Pankhurst's exhortations to save women were all that was required to drive men to the trenches. In that age, men would gladly self-immolate rather than be called a coward. And as for a man's duty to redeem his word to women, this speaks volumes for the pervading sense of obligation to which men were subject. Obligation, not privilege. That the man or boy in receipt of their white feather might be genuinely ill or genuinely underage did not concern the suffragettes. In fact, many were underage because they were the ones who had not yet joined up. So 350,000 underage boys ended up in the army or navy. Others who were white feathered were simply home on leave. But it was not just white feathers. It was the prevailing gendered society which coerced so many underage boys to die in the trenches. Their role was to be disposable. And if even feminists cannot maintain the fiction of male privilege in the face of this obvious carnage, you can be sure they will blame toxic masculinity instead. <laughs>